the topic is uh, uh, SLS 2.0, and it's basically is about removing limitations uh, of SLS uh, to software engineering. Today, it's uh, limited, formally limited to software engineering. Next. <clears throat> so I'll talk about uh, the first point here, what is essence and why, why would you care? Uh, Stefan Malish will later talk about uh, how we remove the limitations, unnecessary limitation. And um, then Simon will talk about uh, the new tooling, which actually revolutionizes uh, the industry. We have never had these kinds of tools before. Uh, we have had fragments of them, but not as uh, complete as, uh, I shouldn't say complete, as um, uh, wide covering as they are now. So next. So if we just understand, the world is full of frameworks. Uh, different frameworks. Uh, the most popular today is SAFE, and there are DAD, there are Disciplined Agile, there are uh, uh, less, there are so many of them, but um, uh, Essence is complementary, not competing to any of them. Most of these other methods uh, focus on content, uh, particular content, and is, some of them are very rich on content. But um, the presentation, how they present them, is um, basically passive instead of active. Whereas essence is uh, focused on actually adoption. That's the strength. So it's not competing. It's very small overlap between essence and any of these methods. Next. The truth of software engineering today, very uncomfortable, is uh, it's uh, it looked like a fashion industry. I'll talk about that uh, separately. We have methods war, which is basically uh, ridiculous. Uh, it's not like uh, marketing wars. It's uh, closer to religious wars, where around every method there is basically a sect around it. We rely on gurus, and gurus are methodology sales people. They are not really uh, experts on everything. They are experts on something, but they have to be uh, represent as well. they are experts on everything. What we need is uh, that the experts are more visible and have more impact. We have no common ground between methods. Uh, I'll talk more about that separately. And finally, we and there are many more, but I'll talk about these uh, five. We have a split between industry practice and academic research. Basically, there is very, very little in the academic world that really is adopted by the industry. And vice versa, there is very little in the academic, ac academicians, among the academicians that care about what the industry is doing. I call these some of the cases things with methods and frameworks. And to be, trust me, the word crazy is not the word I use often, but this is crazy. There is a LinkedIn article that describes this in detail. Next, please. We look like a fashion industry. If we look 1970, we had a JSP, a Jackson, structure program. It's not a complete method, it was, but it was extremely popular. It died. In the 80s, we had things like structural analysis and design technique. There were others, but this is one of the most popular. And people suggested we would use it forever. No, it died. In the 90s, we had my baby, Rob, Rational Unified Process, which was the most popular framework at that time and adopted by all the big companies, uh, basically, it died. Now, in, in the, and then we had CMMI, that was a, had to be adopted by all big companies. We are CMMI certified, level five, and so on. It died. Now we have the most popular framework today is SAFE without any comparison. It's most popular ever. 
And uh, yes, what's the future? Um, we don't know that. Some of us think we know, but the uh, reality is it's not proven. One thing we probably all know is that AI will play a significant role. So every framework preceding, for instance, SAFE has been thrown out and replaced by the next big thing. It's enormous waste for organizations, teams, and individuals. So next, move. And so we as an industry has the responsibility to ensure that the knowledge people have acquired with big effort doesn't become waste. That is what is underlying essence, the idea behind essence. We don't want to have paradigm shifts like this. If our parent, they shouldn't be as big and they shouldn't throw out everything. There is always a way to move, use the existing knowledge and transform it. Let's move. No common ground. All these wonderful frameworks, they share a lot, but it's hidden. It seems just the alphabet is the same. The only thing we share is the English alphabet, if it's presented in English. That is a bit of exaggeration, but it's not far from the truth. If you start, move from having worked with one method to another, you basically have to sit on the benches and learn the new definitions and new, re, new what you already have learned a couple of times. It's difficult to learn from others. So if you are in, for instance, a safe, it's very hard for you to learn from dad or uh, if, for instance, scum, such a simple thing, relatively simple compared to safe, but scum, you have to uh, uh, rewrite scum to some extent. So it's not the same. You have to change terminology and so on because of safe has selected some terminolo terminology. So cross-pollination is good. To learn from one another is very good. Yes. Essence took a different path. Kind of finding the common ground. This is what essence started with. We work on essence started there. Next slide. So now it's, it's a standard since 2014. It was not an easy decision to get it through OMG. There was competition. We had SPEM, which actually came from RAP. Uh, when we developed RAP, we had used the language and so on. And much of that was then separated out and inspired SPEM. There were people that violently uh, reacted to move from spam to essence. But I don't think there is any doubt today that was the right decision. I think personally that um, I have been involved in OG standardization. You know, I was in ADTF uh, 25 years ago. We got UML. I was involved in, in uh, Essence creation, the standard of essence, which was uh, 2014. We got for the first time in the history a common ground. Essence is has two components: a language, <coughs> sorry, a language which is very simple. It's visual, it's intuitive, but it has a deep semantics. But um, no one usually using it really to need to know that. It's hidden. I, I see all essence like uh, uh, as a um, metaphor. I think about um, a car. Most users don't have a, any idea how the motor is designed, but they know how to use it. The same thing uh, with essence. Um, no one, uh, normal user, should have to know uh, essence in detail. They need to know there is a motor, but not more. And then on top of that language, we have identified a kernel, which include the essential things to work with, the essential things to do, and the essential competence you need. 
since it became a standard, there is nothing controversial in essence. Could essence look slightly different? Yeah, it's not a flat optimum. But the value is in having something we can say is a standard and a common ground. And then you can modify it as you want. Next, please. Today, essence is common ground for many methods. In 2017, the first guy who became interested in what SCAM and what essence is was Jeff Sutherland. Not easy because he was very busy, but we succeeded to get a couple of hours with him now and then. So in 2018, he adopted essence to describe SCAM. Later, we have, he had done the same thing with SCAM at scale, which is um, a, a, a grown-up version. And um, it took us probably two years before Jeff Sutherland said, essence is the key to success. And um, then we got to Spotify, one of the most popular um, frameworks or methods in uh, banking, for instance, and uh, in insurance. Kanban by David Anderson, Disciplined Agile by Scott Ambler, the flow system, which is based on Toyota's work on Lean. And it, it seems to be a very successful framework by Nigel Furlow. Uh, Accept and test driven design. Behavior-driven design by Ken Few, story maps by Jeff Patton, and many more. They are all described now on top, or being described on top of essence. This is a dramatic uh, change. We have worked, as you understand, over all these years uh, for, for to get to get where we are today. But now we are ha having not only methodologists, but methodologists are our ambassadors. And we have now the academics, we have uh, 60 plus academics working to develop training in uh, software engineering, which is fundamentally different than what it has been in the past. We have, uh, and we are having tools, we are working with big clients that actually have been using SAFE, for instance, and now transforming to essence-based their own way of working. So there is business now, and that is, of course, uh, needed to be able to continue grow and develop um, and more and more. And we, as so far, we have just started a fantastic journey. And I'm not talking about my company, I'm talking about the industry. It will dramatically change the way we build software and not only software, because many of these methods are not software. They are frameworks for, for uh, any kind of system, many of them. So, and that's the problem with essence we have today, but uh, Stefan will talk more about it later. So let's, next please. So we have what we call killer use cases that never ever has been available to the industry. Today, organizations can build their own ecosystem of composable practices. You compose practice and you get them effort. And of course, there have been simple such ecosystems like a, a list of names, uh, practices, or even small short descriptions. Disciplined Agile, for instance, uh, and the father of Disciplined Agile is uh, uh, very, he, he has uh, adopted essence, as I mentioned earlier, Scott Amblin. There have been such a small ecosystem, but this is an ecosystem where the essence of every practice is described and approved by the owner, the, the founder, of that practice. Not only that, now teams can select their own method from this uh, their ecosystem and uh, by compose, select the practice they want to have and compose them. Never ever been possible before. 
I'm sorry I'm using strong words, but it's, it's exactly what it is. It's no exaggeration. Next, please. All the methodologists have built uh, organizations around them. And they are focused on the learning cycle. People can learn and they can be certified. Um, but when it comes to when they then start to do something, delivery, develop software, there is a gap. That gap is filled by consultants. And unfortunately, there are not so many good consultants. Um, it's very hard to be a good consultant. So there are not so many. We need many, many more to do it this way. So there are lots of um, not so successful cases. I call this the Achilles heel of method adoption. Next, please. Essence gamifies software development by giving teams active instead of passive use experience. All the existing frameworks are, have, uh, are used, learned, adopted, delivered using a passive user experience. And that, by that they mean they, they get training, they get slideware, they get uh, basically um, everything is not, make, not active. Of course, in the training, the teacher can uh, I, I use an act, more active training. But with essence, everything is active because basically every practice is gamified and you play games. Every practice you can play, say, 10, 20 different games. And that is a much more efficient way for people to learn than to learn something than uh, in, in a passive way. Next. We have recently found, and there are so many things that have come without us really understanding it from the beginning. Just a couple of weeks ago, we heard one big insurance company say that they had no other way to learn to comply with government standards in a, in a reasonable way than using essence. But it, that requires in itself a long uh, presentation. We don't have time for it today. I wish we could talk about all these uh, it, to death because it is nothing less than fantastic. The fifth one, for 20, more than 20 years ago, uh, we have worked with, uh, 20 years ago, I founded a company. We developed uh, intelligent agents to, to support rational unified process. We had a fantastic product. Clients loved it, but it came at the same time as Agile. And Agile was anti-AI, and not AI only, also tools. So what Essence is, is, and we have been working towards this goal to, to make sure that Essence is also, AI will come, no doubt. So Essence is a playground for playing AI with ChatGPT and intelligent agents. That's another subject we would love to talk more about. And we are now in the process of uh, adding AI to uh, several of our practices. So that is basically uh, what I wanted to say, uh, but I want to say one more thing before we move over to the next speaker. And that is 20 years, 20 plus years ago, a uh, object management group were extremely successful in getting UML adopted. UML became a world standard and its value and interest grew dramatically. It was decisions were taken in this group. So this group, ADTF, was the group that uh, improved and made uh, the suggestion for that gradient, Jim and I came with, and, and other people, 
uh, made it uh, acceptable and and approved. Um, the same thing five, six years ago, 2014, it's more, it's seven years ago, about um, uh, taking essence as a standard. But essence is a much bigger thing. It dramatically changed the way we think when we develop software. So if essence is successful, and we believe that it will become successful, uh, as you can understand, um, it will probably be a dramatic success, um, not only for people using it, but also for, for OV. So that's why I want to leave it over to Stefan Malik. Uh, first of all, thanks, Eva. And um, I would like to continue um, with an overview of the limitations. Um, which we see uh, to the current essence specification. And I would also like to outline um, our approaches to, to solve and get rid of those limitations. The next one, please. So essence, when you look into the specification, um, that's a standard focusing on software engineering. So, but what about all the other endeavors? Yeah, so projects or endeavors or products which consist not only of software, but also of hardware, for example, or there might be other endeavors which do not have any software at all. So that is currently um, a conflict we see in the specification. And and you move to the next slide, please, Simon. As Eva already mentioned, there are already a lot of practices described based on essence. And as you can see here, some of them are also not just focusing on software engineering. Take, for example, Scrum or Scrum at scale. Yeah, so Scrum is also used in non-software endeavors. And um, what we currently do, um, we manage to, to implement those practices uh, on essence by doing a little bit tweaking, let's say, of the definitions and the semantics. The next one, please. So what is the key here? What is the key challenge and how is this software engineering um, approach or the focus on software engineering manifested in the standard. So what you see here in the middle, um, that is one view um, of the kernel of essence. And what you see here, um, that is a set of seven alphas. And those alphas are the abstract representation of work products. And you can use those alphas um, to track, for example, the progress and health of your endeavor. And as you can see here, um, this focus on software engineering that manifests itself, uh, for example, in this alpha, which is called software system. And of course, also as shown here on the left and right side, yeah, in the text, um, there's always the term of software system used. And in the practices, which I mentioned before, uh, which we have already brought to essence and which have a broader scan, we kind of, abstract a little bit. Yeah? So we know that the scope is of Scrum broader, yeah? but uh, there is still this software system alpha. So what's the challenge here? Um, so we need to broaden the scope. And the next one, please, Simon. Um, the basic idea is um, that we would like to generalize the essence kernel. We would like to make it more universal and therefore make it an yeah, make it available to a broader audience, to a broader scope. And software engineering, so what we have today, could be a specialization yeah, of this new essence kernel. And uh, on specification level, um, we are keeping an eye on making only minor changes to the specification um, to make it more general and kind of define a kernel that is the basis for other kernels. So how could this look like? The next one, Simon, please. So the basic idea is with an update of the specification, we could define something like a kernel you see here on the left side. And you see at the bottom right, there is then an alpha kernel called system. Yeah, So that is quite generic. So, And the current focus on software engineering that could be defined on a um, specialized kernel. And you see here, there, this alpha is a software system. 
Yeah, and the software engineering practices, as you can see on the right side, they are based, for example, on the software engineering kernel. But we are also thinking broader and we don't know exactly what other kernels could be there, but definitely there's the option yeah, to specialize further kernels for other domains and based on that have a kernel for other domain specific practices. So that was would really increase the scope and also the flexibility of the standard. Next one, and that is basically moving over to Simon. Okay, excellent. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to talk about the tooling, both the tooling that we have today that's focused on essence and um, why it's, it's to use Zverse hyperbolic language revolutionary, but also to think a little bit about the tooling that people use today when they come to think about methods and practices and their way of working. So let's start with, with where people are today. Most teams, um, when they think about how they describe their way of working, are probably using um, things like this. Fairly static, passive ways to describe ways of working in text, in wikis, in documents, in PowerPoints. Perhaps if they are using something like Safe or Scrum, they might be going direct to the source, which is always up to date. But again, it's presented in a fairly, fairly static way. Maybe they've defined or specified their processes using tooling, like maybe method park stages, or perhaps they've codified their workflow into a task management product like Jira or Atlassian DevOps. And there's still the odd person that has a pile of dusty manuals and books and course notes that represents their way of working. And that probably is mostly describing the tooling that people are using today. So how's that working for them? Well, in many cases, it's okay. And we do see that teams succeed. But when you look at why they succeed, there's a few key things that have to happen for teams to succeed with tooling like that to support their way of working. The first is they need to know where to look. And when you've got a large number of things to care about, knowing where to look isn't always as easy as it might seem. Secondly, once you've found what you need, you've got to remember it. Now, this is what Ivar talks about as the Achilles heel of method adoption. I've got to remember what Scrum says about the sprint review or remember what the use case story says about the, the order I do things in, or use case 2.0 says about the order I do things in. And then I've got to remember that when I go back and apply it. And then I also need to have the same understanding of things across the team. I need to know that a sprint review is the same as how Stefan perceives a sprint review. This is what team science calls shared mental models. And to get these three things, um, it's quite hard for many teams to do on their own. So very often we bring in consultants and experts to help us. And even if you're doing that, it's still a challenge for teams to adopt their practice as well. And some of the challenges that they face are, are these. So if you have a modeling tool, it's optimized for modeling. It's not optimized for, for using. One of the challenges with that is that when I've put effort and time into specifying my process, I'm generally quite reluctant to change it. And that perpetuates and encourages a sort of one size fits all. There's a reluctance to, to keep things fresh and to evolve it and for different teams to have their version of their process in the tool that's different from another team's version of the process in the tool. And when we think about workflows like Jira, again, it encourages a one size fits all and, and sometimes even mandated. So I, I worked with one organization where teams had decided their own Jira workflows and Jira schemas. And it was, it was very hard to work out what was going on. So they said, well, we want a standard workflow for everybody. Sounds simple. It took them three years to design and migrate the teams onto a standard schema. And of course, once they'd done that, there was no way they wanted to change that. And it became, everybody must follow the same workflow. And one thing we know about today's work in a volatile and uncertain, and complex and ambiguous world that we live in is, Things don't stay static for long. So this one size fits all is actually a really big problem. And the other problem is just the volume of stuff. There's loads of information out there that we've got to keep track on. And if we look at those three those challenges, we can kind of codify them into, into three things that are, are really important and that Essence really helps with. The first is that practices are hard to learn, especially when there's lots going on like SAFE. 
implementing safe takes four days and it's over 350 pages of documentation and that's with more than one slide per page. Even when something is simple, like Scrum at 13 pages, it's hard to get right and it's hard to do well. Jeff Sutherland says 58% of Scrum implementations fail to deliver on time, on value, and with happy customers. So even simpler things are hard to do well. And if you're building your own practices, they're hard to do well as, as well. And, and when we look at organizations, very often they have their own way of working, and it's not clear how that works sometimes. One client designed a portfolio process, and they called it the PMO process. In their documentation for their PMO process, there's five different expansions of the acronym PMO. Project, program, portfolio, management, organization, office, and every combination you can think of. So even in something as simple as that, people find it hard to be consistent. Luckily, as Ivar said, that's where Essence really helps. Essence is all about simplification and it's all about getting the essentials of practice and being clear on it. And having a language with the deep semantics encourages you to think about why things are there and to be clear on things like, when I use PMO, what do the letters stand for? And what that allows us to do with Essence is really revolutionize how people use Essence tooling and what the tooling does for you. And it moves it away from just being a description of how you work to being something a lot more. And the real key to that is the language, because when I've got a standard language, I don't need to know about the practice to create a tool. A tool can understand Scrum without understanding Scrum, because if it understands Essence, and Essence is written, and, and if it understands Essence and Scrum is written with the Essence language, then the tool understands about Essence. So we end up with this situation where I can have any number of different practices like the ones that Stefan and Ivar showed earlier. The tooling doesn't need to be specific for each practice. The tooling just needs to be specific for essence. What that allows us to do is a couple of really important things. It lets the tooling focus on the interactions between elements and it democratizes the practice. It allows you to compare them. And I can place a practice like Scrum on the same level as a practice that I've invented in company X to do some weird requirements thing. And because they're both written in essence, and because they both relate to the common ground, I can compare them and I can see where they are consistent, where they compete, where they clash, uh, and so on. What that lets us do is create practice ecosystems. And that's where we can have a number of practices that teams have to choose. And as Eva said, teams can select the practices. That doesn't very often happen today. Teams typically are told what practices to do, and, they're, and it's back to this one size fits all being a problem. But it is a problem because teams are unique. Their problem is unique and their solution is unique. And the best way for that team to solve that problem with that solution is very often also unique. Now, it doesn't mean that every team needs to be completely different. There's a place for consistency. And Essence allows you to do that because I can create a practice ecosystem. I can choose what practices are in it. And I might make some of those mandatory. So I can use consistency where consistency is important, but I can use empowerment and choice where empowerment and choice are important and it allows you to have the best of both worlds and get away from that one size fits all. And the final thing that Essence allows tools to do is to be actionable, to be active and to be used and to contribute when they're being applied, not just when they're being learned. So the concept of states, Essence has states that you track the progress of. One of the key things with measuring progress using states is that states change less frequently and they're divorced from the work. It means that I can measure, have I achieved an outcome? Not, have I done the tasks that I thought I would need to do? Because very often we find that the tasks we think in advance are necessary don't actually get us to the outcome we want. There's extra things to do. Or sometimes you could have got to the outcome earlier. So it allows us to use tooling to track the state of our endeavor the separate from tracking the work. So this isn't about competing with a uh, work track tool like, like Jira. And then the other aspect of having a visual language is it lends itself open to much more creative and innovative ways, not just to teach a practice, as Ivar said, but to use it. You can create games and collaborations and, um, and serious games to run activities. And when you do that, you get better collaboration, you get better innovation, and ultimately you get better results from your practice.
So that's a kind of brief summary of, of where we are with why essence is, is beneficial for tooling. But I now want to show you a little bit of what the tools that we have today look like, because we do have some tools that we've created. We've got a couple, and I want to show you one, which is this essence and practice team space product, which is our kind of flagship product that teams use to um, help understand essence, but also understand their practices. And I want to show you um, four different things with the tool in the next two minutes or so. The first is this notion about um, bringing things together. And this is about showing how we bring practice together and the common ground of essence allows us to understand them better, to compare them. So in this example, I've got Scrum and Kanban. And uh, if I look at this, this support the team as part of the Essence kernel. It's one of the activity spaces. And it's something that all teams do. Whether they use Scrum or Kanban or a different process, they'll be doing stuff to support themselves. Specifically, what Scrum and Kanban both do is have a thing called a retrospective. So if I'm using both Scrum and Kanban, perhaps I'm migrating from one to the other, Essence allows me to see that both these things are doing very similar work. And I can see um, how they interact with different parts of the, the practice. This is that deep semantics Ivar talked about. And that tells me that maybe I want to choose which one to do, because perhaps they're, they're not sensible to do them both. Otherwise, I might see there's things here that are helping me prepare to do the work, which are from Kanban, but aren't in Scrum. And then there's things that are from um, you know, scrum like sprint planning that, that I might not have in Kanban. The other thing I can see is if I look at other activity spaces, other things that teams need to do to be successful, I can see that neither Scrum nor Kanban have given me anything to do in these areas, and they've not really given me anything to do in these areas. So that tells me if I'm just going to use Scrum and Kanban, I might want to think about picking up some extra practices, maybe some around stakeholder management or some around requirements. Otherwise, I might miss some important things in these parts. So that's showing how we can bring practices together on top of the essence kernel and use that common ground to understand the practice and how they connect a bit better. The second thing I want to show you is what a practice ecosystem looks like. So an ecosystem, as we saw before, is a collection of practices. So I might take some, like, say, um, uh, Scrum, and I might take, uh, for example, um, user stories, and I might take, for example, this behavior-driven development and maybe this um, strategic alignment one. Now, you probably haven't heard of this KC Strat. In fact, I guarantee you haven't heard of this KC Strat because it's something that, that I've invented. This is a simulation based on a real client, actually, but a simulation of an example of a practice that is a custom practice. So this allows me to have a mix of custom practices that I've created for my company, along with the public famous practices like Scrum and, and, uh, and acceptance test and development. The nice thing about Essence though, is because of that previous example I showed you, I know where I got the gaps. So I know where I need to create some custom thinking and I know where I don't. So I can design really quite fine tuned practices and then I can offer them to my teams. And in this example, actually the strategic alignment is one of those mandated practices where all teams need to use that one but they can choose whether they want to use the Spotify ideas for, for managing the work or the Kanban ones down here or the Scrum ones. It's up to the teams, but everybody needs to do this strategic alignment. And finally, I want to show some of the active nature. So this is where teams are actively tracking their progress. Now, like I said before, this isn't about replacing JIRA or, or a ticket management system, but it's about looking at your progress in a slightly more holistic way. In this example here, we're looking at one of the alphas, the stakeholder alpha. This is one of those common ground things. Every team ought to have a view on how well they manage their stakeholders. And if you haven't got a specific stakeholder management practice, the Essence Kernel gives you some really good clues. So I can look at one of these um, and I can see that, for example, I've got three teams here. These two teams have got uh, one box ticked um, and two not ticked, but this team here, they've made a bit more progress and they've got they've got all three ticked. So I can start to compare things. And if I look at one of these ones and I maybe have a conversation with the team, I might decide actually we have represented our key stakeholders and our responsibilities are all nicely defined. Everybody knows what they're doing. We've got an accountability matrix or whatever. And then I can, I can visually see that this is now in a state of recognized. And that means that I've got less risk 
uh, as I go forward with my endeavor. And I can also apply the same kind of principle to um, alphas within a practice. So the stakeholders is part of the core essence standard, but this is something that is a practice on top. And this practice, as it happens, um, is, is another custom practice. And again, we can see that we've got um, states that the EPIC goes through and we can tick off things. And I can see in this one, I've, I've got a gap. So I've not ticked this leading indicators identified and understood. That tells me as a coach, that team might be carrying a little bit of risk. They would be probably more confidently being successful if they had ticked that off. So I've got the ability to have um, practices define what the outcomes are at various stages but they leave the team to decide how they do that. Essence practices don't tell you how to do these things. They just tell you that you should do those things. So that's a very quick canter through the different ways that the tooling implements the language and allows some of those killer use cases that Eva talked about earlier to be realized for teams that use Essence and use the tooling. I mean, we are here to get the advice on what to do to make Essence even better? So That's an idea. Is there a Essence 2.0 RTF or RFP? What is the status of this evolution of Essence that you're proposing or, or discussing? I mean, uh, we have um, uh, had uh, a lot of people discuss this issue. A lot of people want these, these kind of changes. Um, and, um, but we advised by Manfred and Ed Seidowitz, uh, we think this should be an, RT, what do you call it, RTC, and not an R, RFP, RFP, RFC, yeah. Um, and, um, but to do that, we need support. We need uh, ADTF to have discussed it internally and tell us what, uh, what makes sense. So, so I think if, if, we don't have, if we don't have any questions, maybe we should stop recording. Well, I, this is Daniel Brookshire with Dassault, and I just have. Uh, Hello, David. Yeah, yes. Yeah, well, uh, uh, long time listener, first time caller. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I was just wondering right now, you're just, are you, you're just a, uh, a, a model, or just a meta model, or you don't have a profile for this yet, do you? Uh, Manfred would need to be here. He is guiding us. I, I'm not sure I, I can answer that question because the terminology is, you know. Sure. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, yeah, it, I, I think just looking at 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 the standard, uh, I'm assuming that's that's what that is, and uh, 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 it, it would be nice if if it did have a profile. Um, for instance, spam had a had a profile, and and what I mean is is really that you could uh, model this in uh, a uh, UML model as, as, as similar to other standards, similar to how we do, say UAF and, and uh, model a process. And I've done that before in SPAM. I mean, we have in, uh, currently, the old 2014 version of Essence is uh -huh. uh, described in a formal way using, what do you call it? Um, um, MOF and uh, right. even, even something else. So it is uh, formally defined to, an extent, not everything. There, mm -hmm. there are uh, semantic holes mm -hmm. that we have to fill, but uh, uh, it's uh, it's there is a formal definition. Yes, at least uh, the syntax, abstract syntax, or static semantics is formally defined. Mm -hmm. and, and I think uh, Eva, what we we touched that point with Manfred. Yeah, so. Uh, 
what we plan to do, the approaches I presented, they are pretty much similar to the UML profiles. Yeah? Just that we are talking now then about a kernel and we have then a different kernel for a different domain. Uh, but we are not in the details at the moment. But uh, that is basically the idea yeah? to have some uh, these, different, these different kernels or specializations of the yes. kernel. Exactly. So the kernel is, um, the, uh, as we know, suggest, um, is the basis to define the kernel for software engineering, which is the one that we want compat compatibility for, because uh, so many practices are defined yeah. on top of that. Yeah, well, and the reason I, I, I brought this up is so, uh, well, at least right now, as a MOF standard, uh, I can't use it directly in association with a specification like UAF that we were just talking about recently. Uh, and, and UAF being enterprise architecture, it's, it, it'd be nice to be able to describe certain processes uh, directly in, in that standard. I mean, the practices there would be how to create uh, a UAF. So, so we would we um, you could use essence to create the practices that needed to use it. Oh, sure, but you would you would do it in a in a, in another tool. You couldn't do it directly. In, in the same tool. No. And, and that's what a lot of stuff that, 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 that we, at least we adopt into UAF is thing, are things that have profiles. And uh, it would have been nice to bring in SPIM, but SPIM was kind of dead, <laughs> as you were saying. <laughs> I mean, uh, we had a, we had a, you know, SPIM was, came from, originally from, from, uh, our work in, in in my company, Objectory, that resulted in a rational unified process, right. and uh, uh, so we used the SPEM-like language, but the so SPEM was inspired, but it was wrong. It sure. was uh, we had we had passed that level where we wanted so much detail. So um, um, what Essence does is it. it it is such that you can build this ecosystem. I mean, just think about it. How do you build an ecosystem of all the practices you can imagine you need? Uh, and that it was the task we took on us. And uh, thanks to, I would say, the alpha concept, which is unbelievably powerful, <laughs> if, you, if you really try to dig into it. I remember Philip Kusten, he asked many questions and wonder where well, is alphas and so on, and eventually he 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 got it, and it's it's such a fantastic thing that allow us to build ecosystems. And and I think that yeah, the, the, the the approach from a tooling perspective that might be something similar to the UML, yeah, where you're today, for example, with some tooling when you start some project uh, for modeling you for example select then a profile yeah and in the essence world that would be so you select a kernel and then you build and describe the practices based on this kernel so the similar step in between uh, you need to define so on what kernel is your practice based yeah? and this opens up then your opportunity to define practices for domains which we do not have on our radar today Yeah, well, it makes sense in the use, uh, certainly. Uh, uh, well, I, I, I need to think about this, probably talk to Manfred since he's, he's, he's been more aware of it, and I'll talk to him a little bit about it. Yeah. Uh, it, I mean, it, it, is, anyway. it is very positive to this. Uh, he, he would like to use Essence to define practices for using CSML. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and, uh, and well, and, and, and that brings up yet another question on your 2.0. Would you describe it in kernel, or, or is, so you're you know maybe going the route of the new infrastructure under SysML v2, 
uh, or, or, or would you, are you still looking at UML for this? If we're not using UML. I, I, yeah, I'm, we, I, I'm yeah, not sure I understand. UML, we're using UML, Eva, as part of the specification to describe the language and so on. But I think, uh, then we haven't discussed yeah, whether um, in the same step we could also migrate to SysML. We haven't discussed it yet. I don't think we use UML, but maybe I'm wrong. I, I think we are using an abstraction that was used to design UML, namely MOF. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's described in MOF, really. Yeah. 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 